what you're trying to do is sort of effectively sell your preparedness to uh, national governments and to disaster teams. Is it a hard sell in the sense that you're not going in and saying we can provide you with helicopters or with, you know, shiny new vehicles or whatever? You're offering advice and training outside of a disaster situation. Yeah, so actually it's, I would say in general, it's an, an easy sell the idea. So um, it's an obvious need to, um, to prepare for, for emergencies in every country that we are uh, working with and supporting uh, obviously have their disaster risk management uh, in place. They have uh, specific activities, so there's generally an interest. It is more about, let's say, a conflict of resources because, um, yeah, it requires resources in country, it requires resources on the ground. And if you imagine you are a country that frequently is hit and then you're just like recovering, um, setting aside resources for that might sometimes be um, an issue. And secondly, um, what we try here really is to build a, a comprehensive approach, basically where you really have the entire, um, the entire institutional capacity strengthening happening. And that's what here you now the slide is coming. So I guess there's some technical glitch, but I can talk you through as well. Yeah. So it starts with um, a capacity outcome statement. So we define basically um, what, are we, uh, what do we want to achieve? Um, whose capacity do we want to strengthen? Um, local actors. Um, here's an important asterisk because we also take this whole of society approach. That means like not just the, let's say, the obvious actors in country um, uh, as partners, but also actors that could potentially um, bring in added value. It could be sometimes academia, it can be um, civil society groups, etc., that can also bring in an added value and might not always be uh, included in the in a national level uh, disaster risk management strategy. Secondly, to define uh, what we basically want to achieve, um, deliver timely and appropriate emergency response services, and also to define clearly the result um, by uh, defining what we want to do in detail. Now, if we can go to the next slide, if this is a video. Yeah, perfect. Uh, could you just uh, click? Thank you so much. So basically, um, here um, we are um, talking about um, uh, formally theory of change or the um, change process. Um, and if you look at the slide, you can see um, it starts with determining the demand, which is quite obvious, then the capacity creation. That is what we um, showed in the slide before, let's say the classical perspective, how we look at it. But then it goes further to capacity uh, retention, availability, modernization, and also then at the end, institutionalization. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here, if you look in, in detail, those entry points um, are basically bundling um, capacities that we want to strengthen, uh, so-called capacity bundles. And now we can link back to the former slide and basically say, yeah, the classical approach in terms of direct assistance or direct um, um, provision of, uh, of services, of goods, of infrastructure support is just one component, it's just one part of it, a very important one, but nevertheless we look at the holistic picture here. And that's basically the main difference and also coming back to your question, um, if it's easy or hard, um, usually that's what um, the first questions would be if we are um, offering support, would be, okay, great, can you build a bridge? Or yeah, we need warehouses, we know what we need. Um, and yes, absolutely, this is um, where we want to support, but we try not to limit it to it. If you imagine, for example, there would be, um, let's say, a gap in skilled warehouse, um, warehousing staff. So we could do a warehouse training. And we being really the, the entire community of logistics um, uh, or organizations active in, in the logistics cluster. So we could identify a, a partner organization that has the skill set, that has the ability and the willingness to, to do so. But what would you, do we do in a year from now if those people maybe left the warehouse or there was a rotation, change of jobs, and we would potentially fall back to the same situation as before. And that is why we embed this in an entire um, change process to basically not just say, okay, we, we provide training, but rather like how do we look at the entire institution as a system and help this system improve, but, and that's important what I said before, under localization perspective. So with the government in the center and the national stakeholders, um, the organizations in the center of our activities and in the lead. So we are just assisting 
And this assistance quite often goes with a lot of advocacy as well. Uh, and also that is one of the benefits we see with this project that we have several countries at the moment. Uh, we're targeting 20 countries for this year. So we can really also be an, let's say, an international platform where experience can be exchanged between the different countries. Next slide, please. Yeah, the um, capacity bundles or the strengthening activities um, then um, are basically um, defined in so-called impact pathways. So uh, let's say different areas of, of engagement where we then basically, when those activities have been defined, can uh, become active as a community. Um, again, we here really is the entire community of logistics responders or stakeholders, actors that can either bring in um, specific skill sets, uh, information, knowledge, training, in-kind assistance, or even donors in terms of then um, identifying long-term funding projects. Next slide, please. Yeah, the, um, the Institutional Capacity Strengthening Framework is an, let's say, a, a large-scale toolbox that was also designed to be of use beyond uh, this project that we're doing right now. So it's not just about implementing in the countries that we are currently funded for, but also here to, um, to provide a comprehensive a guidance, basically a comprehensive set of, of documents, guidance uh, documents, um, and specific, um, let's say, templates that help and guide you through this process from defining a capacity outcome statement over the theory of change to um, capacity needs mapping where you would actually do in the beginning throughout, at the end, and uh, then later um, in time, really do a snapshot of the situation across several factors um, of the systemic state, so to speak. Um, and yeah, then, of course, it breaks down to a work plan uh, and monitoring mechanisms. Next slide, please. Yeah, we have this available in the internet. If you um, go on logcluster.org slash preparedness slash ICS, um, it will basically download automatically this overview PDF that you see here in the latest version, and you can basically just like click on the documents that you want to access and use. Next slide, please. Um, good. Um, <laughs> I'm not that fast, but I will just quickly <laughs> repeat it. Um, so basically, we have um, a preparedness working group behind this, uh, consisting of um, partners on global level, partner organizations um, that guide this process in terms of subject matter expertise and um, also in-kind direct uh, support. It could be trainings, it could be attending workshops, um, subject matter expertise on the ground, or uh, facilitating specific services or information. And then apparently the slide doesn't want me to talk about the other parts, so I would um, here um, quickly um, mention the current countries that we have. So basically at the moment uh, we are active in three regions. The newest one um, on the, let's say, Western part of the map is um, Americas in the Caribbean, um, uh, where we have a regional project manager. Then we have um, Africa Middle East and uh, Asia Pacific. We are um, targeting in total 20 countries for this year, and the current funding period ends this year. Uh, it was a multi-donor, um, multi-year project, mainly funded by um, BHA, um, USAID, and by the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the next step, and that's where we would like to go to an open uh, discussion and question and answer, is basically what we're looking at now. The first part, how to measure change. Obviously, our project has a project framework, we have our indicators, we have our KPIs, we have output, uh, activity, etc. And um, still, we're not sure, does that really say something about the change that we want to support? So the big question for us is how to measure change. Um, you could compare it, um, if we have a, a system um, that we're here looking at that we try to support, the question is really like, when does this system, let's say, respond better? Yeah. The first issue that we have here is, if you imagine, for example, an airbag, as long as you don't have a car crash, you don't know if the airbag works. Yeah, it is inside your steering wheel, but it's a good question. So um, in the absence of emergencies, which we hope for, obviously, um, still makes it very hard for us to understand now, did these activities that we provided, the, the, support, the support that we provided, did that actually help? Did that bring the added value we anticipated? And then secondly, um, 
behavioral change in itself is a not so easy to measure variable. So you could imagine an um, um, emergency response plan, yeah? Just having it done, let's say our activity indicator, doesn't mean it's, it's improving something. It can just end up in a drawer, no one's looking at it. So the question is really how can we measure change? And the second part that we're looking at now is, let's say, the next phase of this project, transitioning towards long-term activities. That can um, be or is part of uh, the discussion what, we, what our roles will be in the future, um, the support cell in Rome, um, the logistics plus in general, in which role would we support such projects, and to identify as well partners who are, let's say, suited for long-term uh, activities in that matter. Yeah, so I will right. stop here. Um, We're thanks going to bring for that in. slide, because um, that is basically um, what I wanted to end with. So we are um, at the moment a team in Rome of five people, or f from from Rome level, so to speak. Uh, Lila, she's currently based in Panama um, for the um, Americas and the Caribbean. Samuel Terefi, who is um, responsible for Africa and the Middle East, and Aaron Holmes, who is basically um, the project manager for Asia Pacific. Myself, and then we have also a colleague. Uh, working on another project that we will discuss later.